Slate roofing. How cool is it to be able to build a roof out of rocks? It's so cool. This is a stone that has a natural tendency to cleave off in these thin plates. So these are split off in the quarry with a chisel. They're not uh, sawn. It can make a beautiful, durable, fire resistant roof. There's lots of slate roofs that are over 100 years old, even over 200 years old, and it's actually pretty easy to repair. I think this traditional craft embodies a lot of great values. There's like building for multiple generations. There's just like the beauty of this natural material and the craftsmanship that goes into uh, splitting these off in the core even, getting them ready, sending them to the roofer who uh, applies them. Getting back to these traditional crafts kind of helps me find my better self or the self I'd rather be versus this kind of like modern throwaway mindset of like, let's get the cheapest thing in the short term. But wait, there's more. If we cut the slates, we now have endless possibilities for creativity to make something awesome. You can cut the slates basically like paper to any shape you want. You can use different colors to make patterns or write things. You can use different lengths of slates, different widths of slates or both. You can use natural slates that are just large and small random pieces as long as you follow a few simple rules about overlaps then you can use pretty much uh, almost any shape you want and if you avail yourself of all this creative possibility uh, as I found out your roof will take about five times as long to install so I actually started this project about 10 years ago and I finished three sides of the roof and two of the hips probably takes about a day to cut each side so there's probably four or five days just in slate cutting. I've had multiple layers of tar paper on the side of the roof. I've had tarps, you know, I've been up here in the middle of the night in the wind and the rain fixing stuff. Last winter I woke up in the middle of the night and it was raining on Jimmy Reed's head. This is probably the coolest album cover in my collection. I have some of my favorite album covers like down here on the wall above the stereo. Just kind of by chance a lot of the coolest stuff uh, that I own and that's in this room happens to be under the leaky side of the roof. I have all my vinyl records. There's guitars hanging on either side, vintage guitar amps. I also have all this vintage hi-fi gear that I've restored over the years. This power amp right here was bought in 1959 by the original owner. He gave it to me and I electronically restored it and I listen to it all the time. And I also store a lot of my YouTube stuff under here. So cameras, lenses, microphones, and all that sort of stuff. So there's a lot at stake here to get this uh, building weathered in for the winter and not have to worry about that anymore. Probably still got a couple weeks before the first uh, real significant rains. I want to get that side of the roof finished, hopefully get the two remaining hips finished as well, and maybe even design and install the cupola that's going to go uh, on the center of the roof there. So I'm going to run through how this slate roofing system works so you'll understand what I'm doing up on the roof. The first thing we need is cant strips. These are just some thin boards, like maybe half inch, that raise the front edge of the uh, slates. So let's take a look at why we need a cant strip. Now let's say we nail this in place and start our slating. This slate is full length though. So what happens if we nail this slate in place, boink, and we have a gap right here. Or we leave it loose and we have a gap back here either way. So let's say that we were to affix these so they were both flat on the edge of the roof. We have the next slate and that just makes this have a gap. Obviously the solution is to put in a cant strip. Now if you want to figure out what size of cant strip to use, this is a great way to do it. Just mock up these first three slates of the roof, lift this up and eyeball or measure uh, this space under here and just uh, nail something on the edge of the roof to compensate. So here are a couple of mock-ups. The uh, slates on the right are very thin, probably like uh, 3 16ths, under a quarter inch, and the slates on the left are probably up to half inch thick. So as you can see, the cant strip is a lot different, and you're probably going to have cant strips between about 3 8 and 1 inch, but it doesn't really matter what they are. They just use the right size cant strip by mocking it up like this. Now the first row of slates are cut shorter and they're put upside down. So there's a bevel here and there's a straight edge on this side. So if you look at it on this side, it looks just really clean. And this has the bevel. Like normally you want the bevel up because it looks better. But in this case, we're gonna put this one upside down so that when we put the next layer turned with the bevel side up, these two front edges will match flush and it just, again, it just looks better. This you want to overhang about an inch and a half or two inches so it drips on there into your gutter. So obviously these are going to be nailed in place. The second row of slates is uh, full length and it goes right up to the edge and it's flush on this edge. And this is the only time you do this is on the starting course. In every other case it's going to be one row and then you go up and put another row. Okay, so what's going on here? The first row of slates ends right here. So this is the water line. Any water that hits down here below this blue line 
is going to just run off. The seam between the bottom slates is right here. The next row of slates is going to overlap this blue leak line by about three inches. In this case, I'm just going to go a little further down for the starter course. Okay, so before we had a line here that was vulnerable, right? But now that's covered with this slate because this seam is covered. This is the top of the, uh, the first row of slates is right here. So any water that falls below this line basically is going to go down the roof and not through the roof. So here's the place at which it would leak if it wasn't covered. And we're coming down from that about three or four inches. So if you just follow a couple measurements, which is a head lap and side lap, you can use all different shapes of slates or even just random sizes and widths, but you want three inches between the side seam, so it runs up like this, and you want at least three inches this way. Minimum size would be a six inch slate, and you want three inches this way. So the top of this slate is maybe about, it's probably about right here. So we have a good like four inches of overlap right there. So if you think three this way and three this way, then you can pretty much do whatever you want creatively. So when I thought of what kind of pattern I wanted to do for this roof, I thought of our uh, blue belly lizard. So we have this lizard here called a blue belly or Western fence lizard. There's tons of them around here. They're really cute. They're kind of like a mascot around here. Uh, they're real playful and they love to live on the front of this building. So they're always hanging out there and flirting or fighting or whatever they do. Sometimes they come in the house if the door's open and uh, they're just a lot of fun. So I thought I would try to theme the building and especially the roof after these lizards. So when I caught one and looked at the scale pattern, I noticed they had these kind of like long points on the scales, but I can't create that in a slate because it would just be too fragile. Imagine a point like this, this long, those would definitely break. If you could cut them at all, they wouldn't last. So instead I used the negative space like this to create that pattern and the points. So really the negative space here is a little bit more like a blue belly lizard scale, although it's really not because the points aren't this long. I mean, it doesn't really resemble it, but that was the inspiration. And so I just took a look at the lizard and ended up with this kind of stylized uh, pattern. Now, as you go up the roof, these slates graduate. So you can see like this one's pretty blunt. This one's just slightly sharper. This one's slightly sharper. And by the time you get to the top, you have the sharpest ones. There's six of these patterns going up, but it's not like each row is different. There'll be like the first row, there's only one, uh, this blunt pattern. And then there's two rows of this second pattern right here. And then there's two or three rows of this pattern. And at a glance, you know, you can't really tell. It just looks like it kind of changes as it goes up the roof. So we're going to set up the uh, slate cutter and cut a few slates. So like I said, there's six of these patterns. And then there's, you know, other patterns for other things like the uh, starter courses and stuff. And you can just scribe this with a screw or something. I definitely recommend if you're doing anything fancy, make templates for sure. So you get everything the same. This is just a thin aluminum printing press plate, which I recommend people get all the time for other uses like plant tags and stuff. Oh, I got to screw this in. So I just screw this to the table and there's a hole right here. This is just kind of like a little rest. So this is really just as simple as using a paper cutter. It's just a shear and you usually want to be working towards the back of the blade. So you lift this up pretty high. This blade is actually curved a little bit. So that makes it possible to do some inside curves. There's actually, I think, another tool that's specifically for making a little bit tighter curves. And then if you have any kind of like pointed things, you need to be a little bit careful around those. So you probably see I'm having a little trouble with this inside curve, but if I'm just real careful to kind of nibble away at it a little bit at a time, I can get it done. Let's see, there we go. And on this side, we have this nice bevel. There's a couple of things wrong with the holes in this slate. These holes are drilled instead of punched. And that means that there's no divot here for the nail to sit into. You want like a little hollow spot right there. So when you punch from the backside, it punches out like a piece of slate so the nail can rest down inside. Because if it doesn't, the nail can actually wear through the top slate over time. These holes are also too far up. So you want the holes just above the last row of slates, which is gonna be like down in here somewhere. So I wanna move these holes about an inch and a half down. 
And we can do that with this. So I'm going to come down just about an inch and a half. And you want to hold on to this handle and push down on it. I need to get my rest going here. There we go. So you see how it popped out a piece of slate here. And uh, now the nail can kind of rest down in there. Again, pops out a little divot there. You can also punch these on the roof, so I can just take this. You know, I want to support the slate well, but... And this will pop out a, a larger divot, sometimes a really large divot, but most of the holes on this roof that are already there were punched on the roof, even through really thick slates. Sometimes there'll be like a big chunk missing out the back, but it generally uh, ends up working surprisingly well. Fortunately, most of the slates I need to finish this side of the roof are already cut. I had the foresight to cut those a long time ago. That's going to save me about a day of work now, which is pretty awesome. Probably clean up all of these slates and punch a bunch of them down here on the ground before taking them up the roof because that'll just make things a lot easier. I'm going to make the cant strips out of this old fence post. This is uh, probably 80 plus years old. It's old growth redwood, so it's very rot resistant. It splits great. I need about three quarters of an inch thick, so I'm hoping I can get uh, three of them out of here. Look at that. That's just about right. So between these three, I think I have enough. If not, I have other pieces and other fence posts. Well, the roof is pretty much ready to start slating tomorrow. We'll take a look at all of that and uh, get started slapping slates down. Well, the Slate Roof Bible, this is the most important tool. I learned everything I know about slating from this book. It just has all kinds of fun stuff in it and everything you really need to know. Different slating styles from around the world. Here's the uh, German style slating. It's a little bit different than the slating in most other places with these kind of sideways overlapping scales. Really amazing kind of like storybook, fairy tale, black forest stuff. Just a great book. So obviously I'll have, um, you know, affiliate links to this. If you're going to do a slate roof, repair a slate roof, or even salvage slate to do a roof later, just get it and read it. Otherwise, obviously, it's not exactly fun light reading for most people. Flip through this a little bit. Yeah, here's a bunch of stuff on different slate quarries in America. Here's, you know, slate quarries in Maine and Canada. Look at these monsters. They're an uh, inch and a half, up to two inches maybe, inch and a half, something like that. Crazy, crazy heavy roof there. But you can do it. You'd think it's too heavy, but it's done. Oh, these are great. These are like eyebrow dormers. I really wanted to build one of these once and the other roof. Look at this cool woodwork here. It's like bent, bent wood going up the roof like that. So cool. Round stuff. This book's just cool, man. It actually is kind of fun to just flip through and read, but you know, obviously only if you're going to do some slating. This is cool too. You can do like, you know, pictures and stuff. Maybe I should do that somewhere. Do my Skill Cult logo or something. Let's get on that roof and start nailing slates. 